What makes up a city? Is it the roads, the buildings, its people? Or is it a complex interconnected system just like any other living organism? Just as we asked, is a whale, an elephant, a giraffe, and a human being scale versions of one another? We can ask New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Cleveland, and Santa Fe scaled versions of one another, even though they have different geographies, histories, and culture. The astonishing thing you discover when you look at the data is that indeed they are. What happens when you combine ideas from theoretical physics with insights from the natural world? You get Jeffrey West and his colleagues at the Santa Fe Institute, who are pursuing a broad-based view of a new science of cities. Cities have now become so large that they have a kind of autonomy to themselves, even though they're all interconnected. I think it's extremely important when we start to address these questions to have a systemic framework so that we can mitigate the unintended consequences that come from just playing with one part of the system while ignoring the other. Even something as big as global warming and not seeing that that is interconnected with every possible resource you can think of from electricity to water to titanium to rubidium to questions of health, the economy. They always have to be thought of interconnected because if you fiddle with one, you change the other. The serious question now is one of time. By the year 2050, more than 8.5 billion people will call Earth home, with over two-thirds living in cities. With this growth comes greater resource consumption from our buildings, cars, and way of life. This new reality represents a fundamental shift in how we should design, build, and govern our urban areas. Because the fact remains, cities account for up to 70% of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. We've got to start breaking down the barriers and bringing together the multiple disciplines, but also create a matrix in which we see all these multiple problems and see how they're interconnected and how we can forge synergies between them. One innovative model embracing this new science of cities is known as the 2030 districts. Since 2009, 22 cities from across the U.S. and Canada have come together, all working to reduce their environmental impact locally. Modern Metropolis is the story of one city's 18-month journey to become a 2030 district. From the mayor, to a soap company, to your home, this series documents one community's efforts to prepare their city for the future. By the year 2030, over 700 cities will have populations of 1 million people or more, including 43 megacities. Growth projections show that the number of buildings will double over the next four decades. The resource demands from this urban growth require a fundamental shift in how we'll need to prepare our cities for the future. One organization, known as the 2030 Districts, uses an innovative model designed to keep up with this pace. Can you imagine building the entire world out in four decades and then adding it to what we have now? So the scale and the time frame for all this innovation now has become shorter and shorter. Starting in 2009 with the 2030 Challenge for Planning as the framework, Ed Masri and his organization, Architecture 2030, helped launch what would eventually become the 2030 Districts. Their vision? To establish a global network of high-performance building districts and cities aimed at mitigating and adapting to climate change. The districts really serve as a model, but it incorporates a whole community. To do this, building owners, businesses, and local governments come together to make voluntary commitments to a 50% reduction in their energy, water, and transportation-related emissions by the year 2030. To tackle an issue, we look at how we can create a solution that's understandable and that can be implemented fairly quickly and then can scale. That model seems to hold as a way to move forward in cities. Starting in Seattle, then spreading to Cleveland, the 2030 District's network is now in 22 cities and consists of over 1,000 organizations and 1,800 buildings. Nearly 470 million square feet of commercial real estate has been committed to the effort. Long before a district is officially formed, a city must pass through three key phases. This rigorous process helps define what the district will eventually become. Knowing where to start can be difficult, though, so when a small group from Cincinnati wanted to start their own district, they looked to their neighbors in the north for help. And this is Cindy C. Segoy. I'm the executive director of the Cleveland 2030 District. Long known as the mistake on the lake for the burning of its river back in 1969, Cleveland has now become a leader in the 2030 District movement. We were that early adopter that really, I think, got the ball rolling on developing this movement across the country. When you can go to a building owner and show them exactly how their building has been performing over time and the steps that they need to take to start reducing their consumption, improve their operational efficiency, save money, I think that's what's so great about the 2030 districts because it's really a holistic approach. 
To get started, working groups from across the public and private sector build a coalition of support. We are about to submit our formal request to the National 2030 District Organization uh, for Cincinnati to become a, a prospective 2030 district. On our group, we have representatives from local businesses, from major industries located in downtown, a number of people from the design and architecture community, folks from the city and from the community. And I think what's unique to us is that we also have people from the media here helping to document the process that we're going through. Final piece of the submission that we'll be making today is a preliminary boundary or map of the potential 2030 district. This map is deceptively simple. It's actually the result of many conversations that this group had over time. Where we landed is to start out with Cincinnati's Central Business District as the core of the Cincinnati 2030 district, and potentially over time expand that to include areas like Over the Rhine, uh, perhaps Uptown, which is home to major institutions, universities, hospitals, the Cincinnati Zoo, uh, and potentially also into Northern Kentucky. We want to focus on the institutions that are big, but also maybe not the ones that are already incredibly active in this space in order to give them an incentive to kind of give them a helping hand and really bring them into the fold. We're going to email Mr. Dave Lowe, who is the 2030 District Representative nationally. Typing an email is probably not the most exciting thing in the world, but it's a good milestone for us. All right, here we go. We're sending it off. Message has been sent. If you had one word of advice for an oncoming city, what would that be? Just do it. Junk de Juvant, or Strength in Unity, has been the official seal of Cincinnati, Ohio for over 200 years. And while the skyline may be different than it once was, the idea still holds true. Today, as cities like Cincinnati look to the future, this notion may hold the key to tackling climate change through sustainable, resilient cities. Yeah, I mean, you have the Paris Accord, global agreement, but when you look at the solutions that work, they're typically on the ground solutions at city scale. And you look at the number of people living in cities and the amount of emissions that are actually coming out of cities, it, it makes a lot of sense for cities to be the leader, the tool to help achieve these carbon reductions. Since the passing of the Green Cincinnati Plan in 2018, Ollie Croner and the Office of Environment and Sustainability have created dozens of impactful programs for the city. Part of this work included successfully bringing their 2030 district online. At the launch of the Green Cincinnati Plan, the mayor appointed a steering committee comprised of institutional figureheads, right? So leaders from for-profit companies, from universities. They gave us three pillars, sustainability, equity, and resilience. When you think about equity, that really means that you have to hear from a lot of voices, right? And so we held meetings across the city, different communities, held them in churches, held meetings in Spanish, did our best to hear voices that we don't always hear from. And the 2030 District brings in this whole new portfolio of partners who have their own sustainability visions, who said, okay, let's come together, work with the city, work with each other to figure this out. The city of Cincinnati became one of the first 10 founding members of the 2030 district. This critical phase was reached as a result of leadership and coalition building across the private and public sectors. At the end of 2017, a group of volunteers started kicking around an idea of what would it look like to get the biggest buildings in Cincinnati to go green in a meaningful way. This is a concept obviously Pittsburgh has done really well with and uh, some other cities. The table grew and grew as they started bringing in more folks and so we started talking to having it be a part of Green Umbrella and, and what would it take to actually launch that. And then you guys came along and asked me if I would uh, help to recruit folks into it and, and make it happen. So I, I had a meeting with uh, Rodney McMullen, the CEO of Kroger. We, uh, actually, we went on a walk. I said, look, you're already doing a lot of this stuff. Let's combine forces and help create a, a sense of peer pressure on others to lead by example and ask people, not force them to do it because we don't have the legal authority to do it, but ask them to do it because it's the right thing to do. And they, they said yes. It's not about convincing people that climate change is real or not. It's about making the case that all this stuff is great for our community. You know, we're investing in things that are really going to have a positive impact, whether or not you care about climate change. Right, exactly. Never doubt that by working together, we can make a difference. And I think that we will lead by example, but we, it's not just symbolic, it, it will in fact reduce uh, carbon consumption. 
City Hall was part of the city's broader commitment to building efficiency under the 2030 district guidelines. This 125-year-old building stands as an architectural masterpiece of its time and is part of the city's unique history. Clearly a different era, built with grandeur, not really energy efficiency in mind. And you think of a lot of the modern green buildings focus on locally sourced materials. Here you have materials from all over the world to create the ambiance that you see today. But as we think about climate and energy efficiency, we, we have some challenges ahead of us. It's not an, a cheap building to heat or cool. Despite its age, buildings like this can be preserved and retrofitted with new energy saving technology. Lighting is always a starting point. Much of the lighting here has been retrofitted with LEDs already, but not all of it. I'll have to show you our green roof in the courtyard here. We have a very steep slate roof that won't accommodate solar very easily, so we'll have to look at where else we could place solar to feed the building. You know, technology continues to improve. You have to revisit these things. Yeah, I think Cincinnati has really had to pioneer sustainability solutions that have worked economically because we don't often do green for the sake of green. And, you know, energy is cheap here. Waste is cheap here. So in order to make solutions work, you have to make them pencil economically. And that's forced us to be innovative in many regards. Retrofitted green roof. You may know that we're dealing with stormwater troubles across the city. The system helps store and slow stormwater runoff. See all the, the old stacks? Used, used to have a generator here. Things were a little bit different in the 1890s. City government has other buildings, like our District 3 police headquarters, where operation costs were held top of mind. And for a slight premium to build, there's no utility bill in perpetuity. Solar on the roof, geothermal on the ground, the building produces all of the energy it consumes. The District 3 police headquarters on Cincinnati's west side replaced an outdated 100-year-old building in 2015. The $16 million state-of-the-art facility utilizes some of the latest in solar, water, and technical solutions available to make buildings more sustainable. It's also the world's first net zero police station, producing the same amount of energy as it consumes each year. What makes this building really special is that it is a city building that is on 24-7, 365. It never, ever, ever shuts down. How do you get a building like that to be net zero energy? As cities everywhere look to invest in more energy efficient solutions and partnerships, smart and cost effective architecture continues to play a key role in the design of more sustainable buildings like District 3. Combined with green building certification programs such as LEED, which uses a point system to determine how sustainable a building is, meeting the lofty goals of a project this scale requires innovative thinking early on. So the real key to hitting a highly sustainable building is to start early. You leave no watt unturned. You try and test everything to see what is the most cost effective and most efficient, most sustainable way to do it. It's a little hard to see on the building, but when you get to the parking lot, you'll see uh, solar arrays. Those are working better than expected. So in six and a half years, they'll be paid off. And the city actually receives a check from Duke now every year because we're feeding energy back to the grid. So it's actually supporting the, the department. If you could see where we came from, yeah. where we couldn't even have a meeting in our own uh, building because we have no meeting room to the area we have now, it's just incredible. The open uh, design lets a lot of natural light in. Now, sometimes it's the smaller things that can make a world of difference in the daily work life of the officer. There were many meetings that happened prior to the final design on what the community members wanted to see. That buy-in is uh, critical. Um, some of the community comments that we received were parents saying, you know, now they feel comfortable with their child going to visit the police station if they need help. This isn't California, it's not New York, right? This is a conservative mindset that looks at the realities of budget. If it can be done here, it can be done anywhere. Building on the recent momentum, Cincinnati is now constructing what will become the nation's largest municipal solar array, providing clean energy for the city's buildings well into the future. This is a big day. Uh, the city is going big on solar and we're doing it at a savings to the taxpayer and we're cleaning our environment in the process. Just outside the city, a 1,000-acre soybean farm will be the new home to over 300,000 solar panels. Producing 100 megawatts of clean energy, it will help keep 157 million pounds of coal in the ground every year. 
When we set out to start this project, our overall goals were to utilize money that we were already spending. Utilize money that we were using to pump water, that residents were using to power their homes, to utilize that spend that they already have and choose where we're getting our electricity from. Using what is known as a purchase power agreement, the city will be able to lock in energy rates over the next two decades and save taxpayers roughly $1.7 million in the process. In addition, we have, with the 2030 district, we have businesses in downtown Cincinnati who are willing to also invest in solar energy. And our goal is to make it easy for them to bootstrap their needs onto ours. The last thing I'm going to leave you with is due to the size of this array, on sunny days in the summer, city government for the city of Cincinnati will be 100% renewable powered through this array. Right. It is that large. Cincinnati motto is stronger together, and I think that's really what we're faced with today. You know, this is a, one of the most challenging issues humankind has ever faced. It's really an all-hands-on-deck situation. And it's interesting, you know, we put all of this work into creating the 2030 districts, aiming for 50% emissions reductions by 2030, and right after that, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out and said, what it's really going to take is we have to reduce our emissions 50% by 2030, all of us. So it's really aligning, you know, the science and the efforts the politics are coming together. But no individual has all of the solutions, right? So we have to look to each other, look for opportunities to partner, look for ideas to share, ideas to borrow, to figure this out. Skylines, the calling card of our cities. They represent our past, present, and future. They're more than just a collection of steel, glass, and concrete, however. Our city's buildings are made by us and for us. They not only provide a place for shelter, eating, working, and entertainment, they also have a direct impact on our health and well-being. New healthy building design techniques around lighting, air quality, and other employee and occupant amenities are creating not only improvements to individual health, they're actually driving an increase in occupant cognition, focus, and productivity. And in creating the Cincinnati 2030 district model, we've been very deliberate in trying to incorporate health and wellness into what we're doing. For most of human history, we've lived our lives as part of the natural world, spending most of our time outdoors. Population growth and urban living has changed all of that. Today, we spend almost 90% of our time indoors, shut in from the natural world. For decades, sustainable buildings were hermetically sealed from the outdoors, keeping as much energy indoors as possible. This lack of fresh, clean air led to a condition known as sick building syndrome. Now, office work and COVID lockdowns have made us more aware of the connection between the time we spend indoors and our health. There's been a tendency over the years to put everybody in a Dilbert-type cube and standardize when there's nothing standardized about our workforce. Using what is known as the Well Building Standards, which, much like LEED, uses a point system to determine how healthy a building is, based on 11 key components. This is part of a growing discipline of healthy building techniques, emphasizing the occupant's mental and physical well-being. Stuff as basic as incorporating sit-stand desks so employees have the opportunity to spend part of their day sitting, standing up. We just think very holistically about the experience in the workplace. And I think this is all part of a cohesive whole and a cultural shift that we're seeing more broadly. Now, there's indisputable evidence for the case to let more of the natural world in. More natural light, fresh air, and proactively designing our indoor living spaces with the individual in mind. I think the, the marketing team talked a lot about the health component. The partners team talked a little bit about the health component. Are we collectively comfortable moving forward with the health component to this process? Early on, a fourth pillar of occupant health was added as part of the vision of what the Cincinnati 2030 district could be, the first of its kind for any district in the nation. Defining what that looked like, however, required the support from their community. I'd also like to announce that Columbia Plaza and Cushman Wakefield have signed on. That puts us halfway there. We need five more to sign on and we're an official district. So let's get moving with those pens, okay? Thank you. It makes sense to promote collaboration, which is what this project does. Getting people to think through what can we do by working better together to go further faster. 
just to see that group in the room, such diverse stakeholders. The big four that we all wanted to be in the room, Macy's, Kroger, P&G, Fifth Third, they were all there. That really is the culmination of, I think, all of our work over the last nine plus months. We operate against a corporate citizenship framework, but for us to truly be a corporate citizen, we have to be active here at home. The 2030 district is just a great opportunity for us to bring that global program down here to a local level where it's critically important. We've got a framework, we've got a mission, we've got a charge, but we've got to start to develop a more granular understanding of each of these core issues. Energy, water, transportation, building health. Find the people in your community that are passionate about this work. Sit down and, and start talking with them about those possibilities. Dream big. Think of what you can do if, if everything goes right. Aim yourself in that direction and, and get to work. So we are the Contemporary Art Center. We work with artists from around the globe all the time. And we think of ourselves as an institution that deals with contemporary global issues. I feel very strongly that our contemporary global comments is really at stake right now. And I don't think that it is a problem of tomorrow. I think it's a problem of today. The first building to become a member of the Cincinnati 2030 District was the Contemporary Art Center. Built in 2003, this 80,000 square foot building was designed by world-renowned architect Zaha Hadid and procures its electricity from 100% renewable energy sources. Their low carbon footprint is achieved through a combination of innovative water and materials recycling programs throughout the museum. It's not easy. Um, this is why it's, why it's called a challenge and not just, you know, something that falls into your lap. Right, well, what are we waiting for? We are waiting for the call from the National 2030 Districts Network to see if Cincinnati will be ushered in as the 21st 2030 district in the country. From the beginning of a bunch of people meeting and saying, hey, there's this cool idea, how do we make this happen, to actually becoming an official district. Within one year, there, there's an incredible amount of work that went into that. Folks in this community are looking for places and organizations and individuals who want to take on new and innovative ideas and partnerships. Really, the city was right for it. I mean, the community was ready for this. I think we can really come together. I mean, and everybody wants to come together. They want to share that. So the ears are open and everybody's ready. I know you've already heard through a text, but we had a great successful meeting and uh, I think we were unanimously voted in uh, as the newest 2030 district. So congratulations. <laughs> Our story began in early 2018. Cities were bustling, buildings were full, business was strong. Then the pandemic hit and disrupted everything. Priorities shifted. So did the workforce. Today, our cities look a bit different. Less bustle and more closed doors. Offices and buildings stay empty. And more of us work from home, for now. But the city buildings keep running. With 2020 behind us, the year 2030 is just a decade away. But the problem still remains. How do we prepare today's cities for tomorrow's challenges? And what role do the companies that call those cities home play in all of this? You know, the pivot is fundamentally a shift in, in how business thinks of success. Right now, we've had probably 30, 40 years of this dominance of you know, shareholder capitalism or short-term shareholder return as the goal. And the big pivot says that we kind of flip that and we say, we have to solve the world's problems, solve these environmental and social issues, and then work back from there, using capital, using markets, using technology, using competition, to do it in the most profitable way. The cities we live in today must continue to remain dynamic living systems, constantly changing, evolving, adapting, in order to prepare for the future ahead. Because they're not only a reflection of every city's past and the priorities of its present occupants, they're also an inheritance we'll pass on to future generations.